the challenges of running production with multiple computers. This is Tobin Arthur, and I want to welcome you to Pitch Club this evening. It's a great pleasure to have you. We really enjoy putting on Pitch Club every two weeks for our community. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the founder and executive chairman of Angel MD, and we're going to have a great event tonight. And I want to start off by thanking our team that produces this event each week, uh, Jennifer. Dr. Richardson and Mike Shemansky, and you'll see Dr. Richardson and Mike Shemansky here running the event uh, in a few minutes. And we've got some great startups for you tonight, Hymo Therapeutics, Lactiga, and Neuronascent. We're very excited about all three of these companies. Uh, they are all entrepreneurs that we know well, and we want you to get to know them well. We also have a special guest tonight, uh, Ashley Tyson, who is one of the nation's expert, foremost experts on Opportunity Zones, is going to briefly share about Opportunity Opportunity zones, and this is something that all investors and startups should be familiar with. Um, as we get into the event, you're going to see some great sessions. After the sessions, we're going to send out an email uh, tomorrow morning, which will include videos of each of the presentations. You'll have links that we refer to during the session, so don't worry if a link goes by or you miss it in chat. And it's gonna be a lot of fun. Afterwards, we encourage you, we have a great tool that is built into this platform with lounges. And so stick around. All you have to do is once the session closes, you'll see some rooms open up. You select those rooms and you're essentially in a private video conferencing session with the hosts and the companies that are from those rooms. I also want to draw your attention to an event that we are going to be hosting tomorrow evening, same time, 6 p.m. Mountain Time, and we're calling it Time, Talent, and Treasure. And really, here's the gist. We are all building something here that's much bigger than any of us. It's bigger than the startups involved in the network, bigger than all of us individuals, and that is building a much more effective innovation ecosystem in healthcare. But like any successful community, club, country, it's really only as good as the inputs, the investments of the group in, involved in that community. And so we want to make it easy for all of you. If you've got an hour a month, an hour a week, and you want to lean into healthcare innovation, we want to get you plugged into things that would be relevant to you to allow you to lean into this community and really contribute. Now, don't get me wrong. There are lots of ways that our members benefit in the community, and we will show you and talk about the ways that you benefit directly. But we want to really focus on how to build something that's greater than all of us and really improve this ecosystem. A couple of housekeeping items. We're going to put a poll up for the event tonight. It'll stay open for the whole event. We encourage you to take the poll. You'll see questions for each of the three companies. So just answer the questions as those companies present and it's fresh in your mind. This is a very easy way to lean in and that is to give feedback to these great companies. They are here tonight spending their time. They've spent a lot of time preparing for this and they would love to hear from you. So we really encourage you to take the polls. We'll close it down at the end of the event and then we'll share that feedback with each of the companies. If you want to get in touch with these companies, we're also going to make their contact information available. So um, just to recap, Dr. Richardson is going to walk us through tonight. We're going to take a little intermission in the middle and have Ashley Tyson come up and talk about Opportunity Zones. And with that, I want to thank you and welcome you to Pitch Club Therapeutics. Dr. Richardson, the floor is yours. Tobin, thank you so much. Um, and welcome, everyone. We're excited to have you here. I think therapeutics is a difficult space. We are clearly because the timeline is a little more spread out than our digital health or our devices. But we, as Tobin said, have three great companies tonight that we are excited to have share information about their companies and tell us their story. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first presenter, Dr. Michael Bruckman, and he is with Hyma Therapeutics. Michael, welcome. You can go ahead and share your screen and we look forward to hearing all about your company. Great, thank you, Katie. And thank you, Angel MD, for this opportunity. So let me get this pulled up. Um, I'm looking forward to getting some good feedback and interacting with some of your network here. All right, thanks, Katie. Uh, again, you know, I'm Mike Bruckman, I'm the CEO of Hyman Therapeutics, and we are a preclinical stage biotech company located in Cleveland, Ohio, in the Midwest. And we are developing a variety of platelet-inspired therapeutics to control bleeding and also to treat other blood-related disorders where platelets play a key role in their progression, such as thrombosis, inflammation, and cancer. 
Our lead program that I'll be talking about today is an IV injectable hemostatic drug to stop bleeding that can be taken anywhere, meaning this will be a frontline treatment after traumatic injury, saving thousands of lives. Now, traumatic injury or trauma is actually the number one cause of death in people under the age of 44. And that's because there are no products really available to control non-compressible or truncal bleeding at the scene of injury and during that early transportation stage. The next biggest problem for uncontrolled hemorrhage is in bleeding complications that arise during complex surgeries, such as orthopedic surgeries and spinal surgeries, where there's a high reliance on topical products due to the difficulty of accessing blood products. And finally, the, the biggest consumers of donor platelet products are people with low platelet count or thrombocytopenia. And they actually consume over a third of the donor platelet supply. Now, why are platelets used? They're used because they're extremely effective at what they do, and that's controlling bleeding and preventing bleeding from occurring. And that's why over 2 million units of platelets are collected and transfused each year. However, there's a number of shortcomings of these donor platelet products that actually lead to over 20% of, of their collected platelets being thrown away. And that's because of their really strict storage requirements, lack of portability, very short five-day shelf life, and limited donor supply pool. This has led to the development and use of a variety of other hemostatic agents to, to treat bleeding. Now, all of these agents have their own major disadvantages, such as extreme cost, inability to affect primary clotting, or for external, product, pro, or external hemostats, really a lack of the ability to affect systemic bleeding. To this end, a lot of research has been uh, looked into over the past several years into artificial platelets as an alternative therapeutic strategy. Our solution to this problem is a platelet-inspired therapeutic called Synthoplate that is engineered to amplify the body's natural clotting mechanisms by mimicking platelets' function of sticking to an injury site, then aggregating with locally activated platelets, providing additional touch points like Velcro to strengthen the initial platelet plug. This is achieved through surface decoration of our liposomal technology using with three unique peptides that drive its function. As a result, we've de developed a product that has scalable manufacturing, is sterilizable and shelf stable, can be stored as a powder and reconstituted for use. It has reproducible function and it can be integrated with the available hemostatic agents to work together to control bleeding. We currently have a license to four issued platens that cover all of the composition of matter and methods of use for the synthetic platelet platform technology. Now you're all scientists and clinicians out there. So to prove its synthoplate's function, we first induced a thrombocytopenic defect in mice by removing more than 90% of their circulating platelets, leading to a significant increase in bleeding time. Now what we've been able to see is a return of hemostatic function with increasing doses of synthoplate. In a follow-on study, we actually compared this to the real thing and showed that it's very similar in function, not quite as good, but we show that it's a reproducible hemostatic effect and we're able to control bleeding and when very few platelets are available. Next, we wanted to test our product in a traumatic injury model. So we actually took pigs exposed their femoral artery and took a three and a half millimeter punch and nearly lacerated the artery. This leads to complete mortality after about 90 minutes. Now, therapeutic treatment with synthoplate about five minutes after injury, we were able to see significant improvement in survival as a result of reduced blood loss and normalization of arterial pressure. So this is really exciting. This is how we got to where we are today. What I need to point out though, is that in all of our in vivo and ex vivo studies, there's about three or four other in vivo models, we were not able to detect, detect any signs of systemic clotting or adverse effects. It's very important for a hemostatic product that's causing clotting, so it's very safe. Similar to other new technologies, the initial research began over a decade ago uh, at Case Western Reserve University, leading, leading to over seven peer reviewed publications on its development. This early success led to Hymas formation in 2016 to translate the technology. After I joined in 2018, we were able to secure SBIR funding from NIH, NSF, and DOD. 
Now, over the last 18 months, we've actually raised an additional $8 million in non-dilutive funding from the DOD and NSF to continue developing and de-risking this LEAD program. Uh, in addition to that, it's actually helped us secure an exclusive license to the technology and build out the team. As a drug development company, we're following an established pathway to market with anticipated value generating pre-IND, IND, and clinical milestones and the associated costs that you can see along the bottom. Now we're anticipating an, an anticipated potential exit event after phase two clinical studies. That's why it only goes out to that point right now. We can talk about phase three down the road. Now our intention is to supplement these costs, not just with venture capital money, but also with non-dilutive support from DOD and BARDA, which is consistent with other programs similar to ours. Simultaneously, we're going to seek to form a strategic partnership with an established company for research support, ideally leading to a possible M&A or exit licensing exit event. To that end, we've actually had multiple conversations with most of the companies listed here and formed agreements with two of them already, which really validates our business and fundraising strategy. So far, we've been able to build a strong team of scientists and entrepreneurs to manage the company. We have a kick-ass SAB of clinicians, surgeons, blood banking experts, and biologists to guide our translational experts. And, if we, and we've engaged a strong team of partners and consultants with unique expertise to push our product into the clinic and beyond. Now, as we move into the clinic, we will be looking for early adopters to provide feedback and evaluation of our product. So anyone in the audience with expertise and experience in complex surgeries or hematology, oncology, please feel free to reach out to me at the email below. And with that, I'll hand it back to you, Katie. Fantastic. Thank you, Michael. Um, the, this is, I mean, clearly you've put together a great team. And this seems like a no brainer to me, right? This is not something that we have had. It seems better than what is existing on the market and available to physicians when there is either thrombocytopenia or acute bleeding. Um, so very cool. Thank you so much for sharing with us. One of my questions really is around um, the data that you presented today. So that data was in animal models. That's right. How certain are we that this is going to work in humans? And can you talk a little bit about your first in-human studies? Yeah, absolutely. That's a good question. Um, and it comes up quite often, especially with partners uh, that we have ongoing. So we've it, as much research as, we, as we've done into platelets function, the, the binding moieties that our particles are binding to are conserved across species between mice, rats, pigs, and rabbits, and even up to humans. So we're anticipating that the function is gonna carry into humans based on uh, the already demonstrated function in mice, rats, and pigs. Uh, and our clinical strategy is, is based on, if we go back to the, where the problem exists. Um, so traumatic injury is clearly where there's the biggest clinical need or pharmaceutical need because there's really no strong products for controlling bleeding at the scene of injury and during transportation. However, that's an extremely difficult clinical pathway and it adds additional unnecessary risk for a first to market product. So we've developed a, a safer and more established clinical pathway uh, where after you know, safety dose escalating phase one studies, we intend to go into um, you know, high bleeding surgeries such as spinal and orthopedic surgeries or hip replacements, knee replacements in addition to actively bleeding patients with low platelet counts. Um, so that's how we've kind of, uh, based on the advice of our regulatory council and our SAB, consider the kind of the safest pathway to market. So there is one question um, from our audience tonight. Um, Dr. Paul, I'm gonna call him. Um, right. He was asking about how, specifically about the surgical use case and, okay. and how, as you mentioned right here, there is a high reliance on topical products in those types of situations. But can you talk a little bit more clinically about how this might work in a clinical situation like a surgical bleed or post-surgical bleed? 
Yeah, if a surgical bleed is, if excess bleeding is able to be controlled by trans, um, so I mean, typically in surgeries, based on the feedback that, feedback that we've received, uh, donors at risk of bleeding will have some of their blood kind of collected and stored with like a cell saver and then retransfused when the surgeon or anesthesiologist thinks that, you know, they're not able to control the bleeding with a topical glue or gel. Uh, but what happens during that process is all the platelets that are actually causing, that would be useful to actually stop the bleeding are more or less destroyed or become dysfunctional through the collection, storage and retransfusion process. Uh, so this would be used in conjunction or as a replacement for uh, plate, specific platelet use or when uh, they, there isn't like an interest or need in trying to access blood products to transfuse uh, hemostatic agents to control bleeding. Um, there is a caveat here in, in the surgical space. We, we do typically want to stay away from cardi cardiac or cardiovascular surgery and focus more on like the high bleed surgeries. Uh, so this is more of an acute single dose treatment to mitigate active bleeding in those cases. Great. And it sounds like, again, um, this, this would be used alongside transfusions of not only probably packed red cells, but platelets, red cells, of other nine. things that um, would, would be um, currently used for patients in an active bleed, or specifically if a big artery was cut in yeah. that scenario, um, they, they would be, the surgeon, I'm assuming, would be using all methodologies that are, that are available to them, including your drug. That's correct. Yeah. And we actually, that's uh, some of the focus of the ongoing grants that we have with the DOD is how our how our product combines with other blood products to really save injured, in, you know, traumatically injured animals in this case. Um, and we need to make sure, be clear on how this could really be like a force amplifier for transfusion of platelets or plasma or RBCs uh, to, to be a good complement to current uh, treatment strategies. Yeah, and another question from our audience. Um, is there any chance that this would lead to, I'm going to say, overcoagulation, hypercoagulation? <laughs> is, there, is there a way to overshoot? Are we, are we putting too many things in there? Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, you know, during the clot coagulation process, clots are being formed and they're also being broken down. So the body kind of naturally is able to break down a clot that's being formed at the injury site as it's growing so it doesn't grow too big because uh, if it grew too big then we would all clot up and die or have heart right. attacks and strokes anytime we got a cut right uh, and so that's a natural process that the body goes through and these being lipid nanoparticles will be broken up by lipases we see no signs that um, there's a difference in the clot properties that are formed with our particles versus without our particles using some ex vivo assays. Uh, and the second aspect of that is the risk of uh, downstream clotting from occurring. And sure. the particles are actually designed to interact only with activated platelets. And platelets only get activated really at the site of injury. Um, and so they're only, only really interacting with the platelets in a high enough concentration to form a clot at the site of injury. And if they're not interacting, then they'll just get cleared out through the liver and spleen, which is typical of any kind of nanotech, nanoparticle drug product uh, with a half-life of, you know, uh, six to 24 hours. And it's still under investigation. So I, I have several more questions. I'm going to go with two that are coming from our audience. Um, okay. And hopefully during the networking, um, you can talk about other use cases for this technology because I am guessing there are many. But two questions around what's the shelf life? How is it administered? And, and someone who's asking, do you need a device for reconstitution? Because maybe there's another startup you could partner with to um, make that happen. Now that's a good question. Yeah, um, you know, we're we're still very early in the development, so we haven't partnered with anybody to develop a device for reconstitution. Um, and certainly of uh, military interest where you have to have something that's self-contained so that there isn't extra bits and pieces and it's extremely simple to use at the site of injury uh, when it occurs in the field or uh, domestically as a car accident. 
uh, victim or gunshot type of uh, use. For reconstitution, we've been able to just mix it with a small volume of water. So uh, the volumes that we're transfusing and that we would be reconstituting are about, you know, a tenth of the volume of a unit of platelets. So for humans, maybe 50 mils as opposed to 250 mils. So the volume is just maybe 30 seconds to a minute of mixing with water and it's fully reconstituted. Um, and it's injected intravenously. It, we're also gonna be evaluating its efficacy uh, injected as an intraosteous administration. Mm. So, in, you know, through the bone marrow. Sure. Um, and I, I it think- It sounds like very <laughs> stable shelf life as well. Yes, yeah, yeah. These types of products have shelf lives that extend yeah. beyond two years. So yeah, and easily reconstituted in the field. Well, Michael, thank you so much um, for presenting tonight. Very exciting. Hyma Therapeutics again. Thank you for being here. So I have Dr. Viraj Main with me tonight, and he is co-founder and chief scientific officer of a company called Lactiga. So Viraj, go ahead and pull up your slides. Um, I, I have to say as a pediatrician, that this in and of itself is fascinating to me, how you came um, to develop this new therapeutic. So can't wait to hear more. Thank you, Katie. It's such a pleasure to be in a room with you again. Um, so by way of introduction, uh, uh, Lactiga is a company that's actually incorporated in Toronto, in Canada, but my partner and I currently live in New Jersey. So we do have a footprint in two different countries. And today I'm really excited to share with you how we have built this company to protect patients with primary immunodeficiency diseases against mucosal infections. So the category primary immunodeficiency diseases actually uh, constitutes over 400 diseases, many of them quite rare. These are life-threatening conditions with a dearth of solutions. Now, all of these patients in this category are vulnerable to infection pretty much at all times. And I'm not talking about sniffles or cold or mild infections, but rather severe and recurring infections that put these patients in and out of hospitals. Now, for the specific PID disorders we would initially target, that already accounts for over 100,000 Americans with specific PIDs that would need treatments. They experience exacerbated morbidity and mortality especially manifested as recurring mucosal infections in the respiratory and gastrointestinal tracts. There's a very short list of existing treatments, which are expensive, invasive, painful, and have a long list of side effects, which can include nausea, vomiting, uh, diarrhea, severe pain at the site of injection, and extreme lethargy. Most of these in, uh, medications are delivered by infusion or injection, as you can see in some of these graphics. And those infusions can take up to eight hours, and that's going to happen at least once a month for the rest of their lives. Now, as we think about additional conditions where severe mucosal infections are prevalent, that includes several cancers, such as lung and gastric cancers, as well as AIDS. And that stacks an additional 1.8 million Americans on top of our, our first go-to-market indications. So to address this dearth of existing treatments, we are developing our patented solution, which contains dimeric IgA antibodies, and these are derived from human milk or breast milk. And that's because human milk is naturally enriched for dimeric IgA antibodies, which are the only antibody subtypes known to be stable in the mucosal compartments. And you can see their dimeric structure in that small cartoon. These are highly polyclonal, which means they provide coverage against all forms of pathogens, viral, bacterial, fungal, parasitic, etc. Now, human milk is the only scalable source of dimeric IgA, and for that reason, we have already built an international supply chain, the world's first, involving the global network of nonprofit milk banks, which I'm happy to share more in the Q&A. In addition to leveraging these interesting properties of IgA antibodies, we're also developing novel delivery solutions you can see in the bottom half. Specifically, we're developing these into respiratory formulations, and you can see an example of a home nebulizer in this photo as well as oral products for gastrointestinal delivery. That makes our products differentiated, low cost, easy to use adjunctive therapies to existing treatments that would not require needles, phlebotomists, or any type of specialty care. Put simply on the bottom, IgA milk antibodies can do what serum antibodies cannot. And this is supported by pretty extensive in vitro validation we have completed. So across the top half of this graphic, we looked at ability of milk antibodies to neutralize RSV or respiratory syncytial virus, a major driver of a severe common cold. 
When we first looked at cellular neutralization using milk antibodies, we determined 85% neutralization of RSV. When those antibodies were frozen and subsequently thawed after three years to retest them, they retained 64% neutralization. Additionally, we looked at room temperature shelf stability, which is on the top right, and for at least two weeks, they can sit at room temperature with no reduction in stability, really telling you about the durability of these milk antibodies. Now across the bottom half of this chart, these actually reflect our SARS-CoV-2 data sets for COVID-19 in conjunction with our partner at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City, which is supported by a large NIH grant. And these figures on the bottom are actually from a peer-reviewed publication. And specifically, we looked at the presence of COVID-specific antibodies in milk samples from COVID-infected mothers. 100% of those milk antibody samples are capable of binding the novel coronavirus spike protein. In the middle, you can see that 80% of those samples also bind the receptor binding domain, or RBD. And even more importantly, on the right, those antibodies are capable of 100% inhibition of cellular entry. So, very compelling in vitro data set. But what gives us the confidence to believe that this will translate to a successful nebulizer delivery program? Well, there's two layers here. First, in terms of the existing background, as I mentioned, milk is known to have a natural abundance of dimeric IgA antibodies. If you look at the red um, circle on the top right, you can appreciate how different these are structurally compared to other antibodies. And that makes them uniquely stable and bioactive in the respiratory tract. But in addition to that, airway delivery of these IgA antibodies is in fact a de-risked concept with significant stakeholder support. And what I mean specifically by that is that we have a research collaboration with Mount Sinai Hospital, as well as an exclusive commercial commercialization agreement with them. This is supported by a $2 million NIH grant plus two other cash awards, all in support of our nebulized COVID-19 treatment. We took our technology notes and submitted a pre-IND to the FDA last summer and secured their written feedback to further guide our COVID-19 nebulizer program. And thinking more broadly, there is in fact several pieces of peer-reviewed literature about the anti-infective properties of IgA in the lungs. For example, this example of neutralizing Pseudomonas aeruginosa, a severe respiratory infection in the mouse lungs. And lastly on the bottom, antibodies have also been nebulized and traced in the primate lungs. Taken together, IgA antibodies are able to be delivered and are highly effective in the mammalian respiratory tract. So on this slide, I'd like to give you a brief overview of the company history, uh, drawing your attention just to the blue headings across the top. So as an early self-funded company back in 2017, we really focused on patent enabling research engagements with top tier research institutions. Last year was a big year to open up our COVID-19 program, uh, execute the collaboration with Mount Sinai and open milk supply agreements in three different countries, the US, Canada, and the UK, while also having our Canadian patent issued. Now this year, 2021 has been quite massive for us because we've moved from early proof of concept into the actual manufacturing engagements represented by the logos you can see here. Not to mention we had our US and Japanese patents also issued. So by focusing on the manufacturing, which is our current priority, that allows us to transition into non-clinical efficacy, leading to an IND submission in the year 2022, which ultimately allows us to conclude a phase one clinical trial in the year 2023, which is the final deliverable you can see on this slide. So who is the team to execute on this highly transformative and ambitious vision? Well, speaking for myself, I have a PhD in human genetics and five issued patents. So I'm leading the IP and research portfolios. Now the perfect complement to my skill set is found in my co-founder, Rick and Mehta. He's a former FDA official. He has held senior roles at Pfizer and Equestive. So he not only has regulatory expertise, but also a corporate pharma background. For the larger Lactiva team, you can see on the bottom, we have quite a deep, deep stack of credentials. We have a medical advisor who actually treats the primary immunodeficiency patients I've been talking about. We also have a roster of research collaborators with highly specialized skill sets relevant to our work, which has helped us access NIH funds as well as other programs and has led to two institutional commercialization agreements. Finally, we have KOLs who are the chief executives of North America's largest immunodeficiency patient foundations, whose logos you can see at the bottom. So with that, I'll stop here and I really look forward to your questions and feedback. Thanks so much. Viraj, thank you again for being here and uh, sharing with us about Lactiga. This is really exciting. You know, one of the things, um, you know, that I think about in my mind, like that there are a lot of moms out there having babies for sure. And it sounds like you have some good partnerships 
um, with these milk banks, which is very cool. But how do you know this is scalable, right? I mean, is it sustainable through development, production, et cetera? Indeed, it's a great question. And so uh, people typically assume like, well, there can't be that much out there. And even if there was, why would they give it to a company like yours? And so here's some of the stats that support um, our scalability. So there are over 700 milk banks around the world. They primarily function as a large network of nonprofit institutions. About 32 of them are in North America. We have already opened supply commitments, as I mentioned previously, in three countries. And we were able to do that because we positioned a story about bringing novel medical benefit to highly vulnerable patients in a way that aligns with their mandate. Now, their mandate is, of course, to focus on medically fragile babies, especially premature babies. By being very sensitive to make sure we could support their core mandate and never interfere with eligible milk that they needed for their purposes, we could instead focus on the unused fraction of their volume. And by the way, each of these institutions can discard up to 15% of their supply because it doesn't meet their inclusion criteria, but it does meet our inclusion criteria. And so just to give you a snapshot of what just today's small handful of commitments already gives us, it puts us in the ballpark of dosing 10,000 to 30,000 patients per year, just using today's commitments, which represent four or five entities. Again, that means there's about 695 other milk banks we could still tap. And the early wow. champions of milk bank directors have been extremely vocal and proactive about reaching out to their colleagues on our behalf sometimes without us even being in the room. They're so motivated, they're actually having these discussions. So we are fully confident that the supply network will only grow simply because we have focused on alignment with their core mandate before we ever started opening this discussion. Sure, no, that, that sounds awesome. Um, it sounds like you have done your homework and, and definitely approached this in the right way, which is great. We had to be very sensitive, knowing I the bet. audience. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Um, so one other question that I have, just from a perspective of you and I have talked about a patient actually that I was um, involved with, peripherally involved with, I would say, because this was an adult patient recently um, with a severe immunodeficiency. The patient, you know, story that you gave actually during your presentation. And what I know is there are there aren't a huge number, right, of those patients that are out there. So it seems like you're starting with a smaller market in the grand scheme of things, but I am guessing the same technology can be applied to other use cases and other larger markets. So talk a little bit more about that. It's a great question. You know, there is an assumption more broadly that if you're targeting a rare disease, there are so few patients, you'll never make, you know, you'll never make much revenue as a biotech company. Uh, you know, that's that's doesn't align with the various different rare disease incentives that are out there. And I have another slide maybe we can touch on it in a second. But to give you a sense, um, Katie, you're absolutely right. There is the primary immunodeficiency cohort on which we really developed this company because of how closely these solutions would match their needs. And that's the um, that's the addressable market we're showing on the left. So and this is just in the United States. So we're looking at around 100,000 PID patients, which are highly symptomatic because of selective IgA deficiency or common variable immune deficiency. With our target price, uh, revenue price of $25,000 treatment revenue per year per patient times 100,000 patients, that's a $2.5 billion figure. As I mentioned very briefly in the presentation, as we expand outwards, it will be logical to address other patients who also have frequent uh, recurring and severe mucosal infections. Right off the bat, that includes patients with gastric cancer, lung cancer, which is this middle uh, bucket. And then AIDS patients, of course, are also afflicted by uh, severe and recurring mucosal infections. So this sure. figure, uh, or this slide by itself is already a $10 billion figure. And these are just three of the longer list of indications that we would ultimately target. And to your point, this is absolutely a platform technology. As we uh, develop out the respiratory formulation and then the oral formulation, those can be uh, we can apply for additional indications without really having to reformulate them or to redesign them. The goal is to use the platform technologies as broadly as we can. Well, that's fantastic. Viraj, again, thank you for being here tonight. I know there are a few questions in our Q&A from the audience that we did not get to, but during the networking session, I'm sure Viraj would be happy to take those questions. And I just, um, again, exciting company. I love what you're doing. Thank you again for being here tonight. Um, 
and I am going to turn things over. Um, well, one reminder, one quick reminder, um, please go in and fill out your poll for Lactiga. Again, we're going to keep the poll open during the entire event, um, but all of these CEOs and founders are looking forward to your feedback. And while you are doing that, I'm going to turn things over back over to Tobin to talk about our additional special guest speaker for tonight. Thanks, Katie. I'm going to keep this brief because I'd like to give the time to our next guest. And Ashley Tyson is an attorney. He is one of the nation's foremost experts in opportunity zones. He is the founder of a number of groups surrounding that space, OZ Pros, OZDB, and others. He's a very entrepreneurial uh, guy, and we are very pleased, Ashley, to have you here tonight. Ashley's just going to share with us uh, a little bit about OZs, Opportunity Zones, because for all of you who are investors, for all of you startups, you need to know about these. They are a very powerful tax opportunity. And as we approach the end of the year, we wanted to get Ashley in here to give a little bit of an insert. We're building a partnership with Ashley's organizations. We're going to be providing more education to the AngelMD community. Ashley has also offered and agreed to join us tomorrow evening for the Time, Talent, and Treasure session to touch on a little bit further uh, some of the other further aspects of the Opportunity Zone. So, Ashley, thanks for joining us and uh, uh, welcome. Thanks, Tobin. I appreciate it. Um, I'm trying to share my screen, but I'm not sure if that uh, actually clicked in. Um, You're good. We can see it now. Awesome. <clears throat> now, what about my uh, my my drawing skills over here? They're impeccable. Oh, awesome. <laughs> so, you know, you do not want me as your Pictionary partner. Trust me. But I'm going to do my best, uh, you know, my, my best impression of Jay Billis here as a sportscaster using the, you know, the touchscreen and the illustrator, the teleprompter, if you will. So what is an opportunity zone? And uh, they were created by the Tax Cut and Jobs Act in 2017 and effectively they were designed as a program to incentivize investment into typically underinvested areas and so as kind of a as a, a writer almost an afterthought of cramming it into this you know thousands of pages of legislation it literally was six pages that created what i think is arguably the best tax incentive that congress has ever created now there's been some great kind of workarounds that people have done but this is an actually legislative created incentive that encourages people to take capital gains money and put it into these areas and, and get a fantastic tax benefit. So as part of that, the, the legislator allowed each governor to designate up to 25% of their low income census tracts as opportunity zones. So there's roughly 8,700 of those. And uh, you can find a map of them at opportunitydb.com map. And you can search up here uh, for your address. And if it pops up blue, like one of these shaded places right here, then uh, it, you're going to be inside the zone. Now, what's significant about the zone and the benefits that, uh, that happen inside of the zone is that when you make an investment, right? So from a capital gain into a qualified opportunity fund within 180 days of whatever capital gain that is, the first benefit that you get is that you get to defer the gain on that sale uh, until December 31st, 2026. So you get to shift it into hopefully a new administration and maybe a new legislation or, or legislature that can uh, that, that might have some different ideas about what they want to do with the capital gains tax. So that's the first benefit is that you effectively get an interest free loan from the government. The second benefit is that if you're invested for five years prior to that date, which means that you invest by December 31st of 2021, you're going to get a 10% step up in basis on your taxes. So you're going to get a 10% reduction equivalently. So if you're invested by December 31st into a qualified opportunity fund, which is why it was significant that Tobin said, hey, listen, I want to get this out in front of people before the end of the year, you get a 10% reduction in this taxes when you go to pay them. But the third benefit, and this is the biggest one, is that after you've held your investment in the fund for 10 years, you get a step up in basis to fair market value. And what that does is it not only eliminates capital gains taxes, but it also eliminates depreciation recapture. And so for you investors that are out there, you know, when you're looking at a side by side deal and you can take effectively tax free income over the life of the deal via depreciation uh, and accelerated depreciation, 
and then exit that deal after 10 years and not get hit with any depreciation recapture, it quickly becomes investor nirvana. And so these are kind of the basics. And this is the, 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 the cheat sheet, if you will. Actually, this is my opportunity zone cheat sheet right here. And, uh, and we can provide this and we regularly kind of send this around and happy to answer any questions that, uh, that, that folks may have in the, the networking session and in the Q&A afterwards. But you got to dump your money from a capital gain into the QOF within 180 days. Now, that's, uh, that's 180 days from the tax filing deadline if you are uh, in a partnership or an, L, uh, an S Corp. And so you actually get till September 11th of the following year after the gain. But once it's inside of the QOF, that's what starts your 10 year clock. But when you're in the QOF, you have to have 90 percent of your assets invested in Opportunity Zone property, which you can either own directly or you can own through a QOZB. If you do it through a QOZB, you actually get another 31 months as a working capital safe harbor to spend that money. And so if you do the math on that by putting your money into a QOF, and then ultimately giving it down into a QOZB, you get almost four years to find a deal and to figure out where you ultimately want to place this money. So now this QOF and a qualified opportunity fund, all it is is basically a partnership or a corporation that's formed for the purpose of investing in opportunities on property. So we regularly set these up for people where they're captive LLCs that are taxed as partnerships that then the folks that make their investment into them, they then, uh, they've effectively delayed when they have to pay the capital gains and they get a period of time so they can go out and find other investments. Now, don't recommend, and uh, you know certainly we would not recommend utilizing this as a tax deferral, just as purely a tax deferral strategy. Not saying that anybody would do that or anything, but uh, certainly uh, I think that, that 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 has run through people's minds as a way to, okay, I don't necessarily know what I'm going to do right now, but this is a way that I can buy myself some time and I can figure it out. The other play is that there's significant established funds out there that have great real estate deals, operating business deals, and other types of investments that you can make into uh, these qualified opportunity zone businesses which then go out and either invest into opportunity zone business property or they actually run a business. So if you're a startup and you're thinking about going out to raise money and you don't have your location agnostic where you can pretty much set up wherever you want to, you're crazy not to take a look at opportunity zones because of after this 10 year hold at the QOF level, Every dime is coming out tax-free to your investors. So that's significant for the people. And I think the people on this call as well, because, you know, we're looking at lots of alpha. We're looking at lots of, uh, you know, return on investment growing from very small up to very large. And this is a way to eliminate taxes on that on the back end. And, you know, th at 23.8%, eliminating that, and, you know, we can anticipate that that's probably going to go up that this is the way to not only you know, hedge against potential tax increases, but effectively eliminate them going forward. I can get into the details and I'd be happy to do that for folks. We've got a process where we do strategy calls for uh, anybody that's interested in learning about opportunity zones or setting up their own fund or looking at uh, potential investments. Uh, we specifically do that at, uh, at OZ Pros and you can go to ozpros.com and you can kind of learn about what we do. Um, I'm partnered with Jimmy Atkinson, who's the host of the Opportunity Zones podcast. His site is OpportunityDB.com, and it's got a beginner's guide to Opportunity Zones. We've got our Opportunity Zone cheat sheet on our website, but we'll be happy to answer any further questions, walk through what I think could be the greatest tax incentive ever legislated by our Congress. So uh, look forward to talking OZs. Hey, Ashley, thanks a ton. This is incredible stuff. And I think everybody's got a sense of how big this is. We're going to be providing a lot of education um, with Ashley and Jimmy over the coming weeks and months. But as he indicated, there is some very, very big uh, cliffs coming that some of you might want to take advantage of. So we're going to provide the links uh, to some of the things that Ashley referenced in the follow-up email. 
and we'll be getting into more detail. And, and by the way, Ashley's team has helped Angel MD now convert to an Opportunity Zone company for this very reason. We're putting our money where our mouth is, so to speak. And so for you startups, as he said, you'd be crazy not to look into this, particularly if you have some agnostic uh, elements to your location. So without further ado, I want to turn it back over to Dr. Richardson. Ashley has been gracious enough to stick around afterwards in the uh, lounge. And so you can pick his brain there. And as I said, there'll be more information forthcoming. Fantastic. Thank you, Tobin. Thank you, Ashley. Like, very exciting. Clearly, some amazing opportunities here. And we want to make sure that we give uh, enough time to our last uh, presenter of the evening. So we have Dr. Judith Kelleher Anderson, who is the present, president and CEO of NeuroNascent. Judith, thank you so much for being here tonight, and I'm going to turn it over to you. You may share your slides. Thank you, Katie. So um, as Katie mentioned, I am the founder and CEO of NeuroNascent. It's a clinical stage company, and we have small molecule therapeutics that are neuron regenerative. So the aim is to actually cure age-related disorders. So everybody knows that there's no therapeutics available for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's that will slow or even reverse the disorder. And this has, um, so there's continual neuron loss. In, in fact, in the human brain, we actually have two regions of the brain, as pointed out here, that continue to make new neurons throughout the lifespan. The problem being is that as we age, this process slows down. So now you have slower production of new neurons and the, the loss of neurons during progressive neurodegenerative diseases. So what we did um, was that neuronascent scientists said, okay, how can we address this? And so we set up a, what's called a, a phenotypic screening platform, whereby we looked for their novel therapeutics that actually produce first and foremost, new neurons, so neuron genesis within the brain, and then secondarily, producing neuroprotective capacity as well. Now we want this to occur in the human condition, so we started with human neural progenitor cells, and we use commercial small molecule libraries that target kinase modulators. And we say kinase modulators because really kinases take care of almost every function within the body. So um, by targeting those we know we're going to affect the human condition. So as we went through this funnel, the filtrate that came out was NNI362. NNI362 actually crosses the blood-brain barrier and is orally available. So when we test and then when we tested NNI362 by administering orally to very aged mice um, that um, we administered every day for up to six weeks time period. And we can see here that this, this is a hippocampal slice. Very few uh, neurons are even observed anymore in these aged mice, uh, new neurons observed. But with NNI362 treatment, not only do we get new neurons, but they actually survive for the full six month, six week time period. This is very similar, as you can see with the arrows, to what we see in young mice. When we look at uh, what's happening um, in both aging and another model, Down syndrome, we see that we indeed can increase the, the actual number of new neurons that uh, survive to maturation versus young animals um, in this case. And then in Down syndrome, we produce many more, with NNI362 treatment, we see many more new neurons 
actually back to wild type levels. And what's the most interesting here, and the reason we believe we can reverse deficits um, in, in humans as well, is that this ability to produce new neurons actually reversed the cognitive deficit first in aging animals back to young levels here, and also in Down syndrome mice that had um, cognitive deficit, we reversed it back to the wild type levels. After considerable further testing, we found that NNI362 actually um, works at a specific kinase, P70S6 kinase or S6 kinase. Um, and this kinase is downstream of mTOR. And mTOR is a very common kinase that has been targeted by a number of companies where though mTOR kinase um, inhibitors that have been tested in human for uh, for example, for Alzheimer's, et cetera, actually showed no efficacy. And in fact, there's some toxic uh, side effects. So with NNI362 promoting an allosteric stimulation of S6 kinase, where we actually turn on translation selectively within the neuron so that we can promote proliferation, differentiation, and actually the maturation of neurons. So what this actually does is by stimulating S6 kinase, this is a first in category therapeutic that's not only efficacious, but selective for neurons and safe. In terms of our timeline, we've done quite a bit. Um, we have raised equity and um, quite a bit of non-dilutive funding, especially from the National Institute of Aging. This, these funds supported not only the discovery stage and the developmental stage, but also all of our issued patents throughout the world as uh, in US as well as Europe, Asia, and allowed us to complete the phase 1A in an aged population for Alzheimer's disease. So this occurred, we finished this um, trial in 2021. The, our next aim is to go, uh, is to raise more funds for a phase two proof of concept trial for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. Here, after we prove proof of concept, the aim is to exit with one of these pharmaceutical companies listed here that we have really been nurturing these relationships for a number of years for just that purpose. And so um, that is the aim of at least one of those um, pharmaceutical relationships. And, and I'm happy to take any questions. Back to you, Katie. Great, Judith, thank you so much for um, talking to us about neuronascent and this exciting, I would say novel therapeutic in the treatment of Alzheimer's and other neurologic diseases. Um, I, I, you know, we have one question from the audience and, and you know, it, it harkens back to whether it's your neuro, neurobiology or your biochemistry or any and all of these things, right? What? Production of new neurons? That's really what you're doing? Um, I, I want to know a little bit more about your first in-human studies. You talked about the fact that you just completed those. Talk about, like, did you see any adverse events? Um, it seems like something like this could lead to um, kind of an aberrant growth of neurons. How do we know that these are functioning neurons? All of those things. Talk a little bit more about that. Great. So that, that there's a lot in that, packed in that. Yes. And so I'll, I'll start with the uh, clinical trial. So as mentioned, we just finished. We, um, we were using um, aged subjects. So though we're, we didn't use Alzheimer's patients, we used aged individuals who are 
eventually going to receive um, the therapeutic. We had, um, we actually had a higher percentage of placebo having uh, mild grade AEs than our drugs. So it's extremely safe um, and we did not reach a maximum tolerated dose. So that's really important. And then um, in terms of where we see growth, in fact, as mentioned in, a, in the earlier slide, there are two regions of the brain that continue to produce new neurons. So this isn't, uh, this isn't a, uh, a strange phenomena. We're taking advantage of the, how the, brain, the endogenous production of new neuron occurs. And so we're just pushing that further along. And what we found was that for the hippocampus, um, there is um, constant re, um, uh, new neurons being formed, and these are adult-born neurons, um, and that's really important for memory, continued memory, uh, and new memories. And so this, this is a very common phenomena. We notice that anywhere else in the brain, there has to be an injury before we see new neurons. And so that's a really wonderful safeguard so that unless there's an injury there, we're not going to produce new neurons in that region. All right, thank you for going more in detail about that <laughs> because I think I, I think there's a lot of questions, right? This is something, sure. again, Absolutely. For those of us that have went to medical school a little while ago that, you know, this is new stuff. So thank you for going into detail about that. We have a couple of questions um, related to sports injuries. So utility and TBI, utility, utility in the early onset of dementia in, I'm just going to say, professional football players, et cetera. Um, any thoughts on that? Absolutely. So we we started with chronic neurodegenerative disorders. So we have not really looked at acute, but there's no reason to, we, we kind of actually took the high bar in terms of very progressive chronic diseases. So we think if we can reverse these chronic disorders, and we see this in Parkinson's model, aging models, Down syndrome, we believe that we definitely could reverse under an acute condition as well. Very cool. And one last question for you, because I don't want to shortchange you at all. In your preliminary studies, any side effects, any off-target effects of this kinase inhibitor that you have seen? That's really important, especially for kinases. There are always worried. Remember, this is not a kinase inhibitor. This is a kinase stimulator and it works allosterically. So we've had no off-target effects. And as I mentioned, in the aged individuals, we found no um, safety concerns whatsoever. Well, I know, um... Both Mike and I are hoping for our shipment in the mail so we can start using it on a regular basis. Um, but thank you for being here tonight, Judith, uh, and thank presenting you. about Neuronascent to us. This is very exciting research and we look forward to hearing more about your success and your results as things move through more clinical trials. Um, I'm going to close Thanks, very quickly because we very much try to end these on time. And I know there were a lot of questions from the audience that we did not get to. So I want to allow those of you that are here to interact with all of our presenters as well as Ashley around our Opportunity Zones and the Angel MD team. But before I do that, again, for those of you, this may be your first time here on Pitch Club on Air Meet. Essentially, you, once you get back into the networking lounge, all you have to do is click on a chair around one of the tables that you want to visit, and you will enter into that room. And just a reminder that there will be follow-up emails with all of the contact information and the videos and um, links to their Angel MD profiles, as well as our YouTube channel, as well as our Pitch Club website 
and our LinkedIn group related to Pitch Club as well. That will come out tomorrow or the following day. So you will get additional information there. As Tobin mentioned, we have an event tomorrow night where you can learn much more about Opportunity Zones. So we will also have information about that event if you're interested in learning more, which will be super exciting. And lastly, I would be remiss if I did not say that our next pitch club is Tuesday, October 26th, and it is focused on innovation in emergency medicine. So I hope you will join us there as well. Thank you all for being here tonight and we will close off so we can move on to our networking lounge. <laughs>